Lee Smith, and Sean Franklin. Here from Blood and Iron Martial Arts for our Patreon subscribers. We have two questions for this session. Okay, so the first question is about Meyer's use of the key guard. Now, really quick, what is key guard? It's a point forward guard with the point retracted and resting on your arm. It's kind of like, you know, you're in your uh, cross docks and you just bring it down really lazy and the point's online. Jesse Tucker <laughs> loves this guard. Why is this good? Okay, so the idea from here is that you want to shoot straight out with the point. You could, in theory, roll this up to some controlled thrust position and it would work just fine, but you can do that from just about any other, you know, point forward guard as well. So you're not really gaining a lot from this position. The idea is you want to shoot that point straight, forcing them to do an oh shit response. So the way the play works, your opponent is more or less going to be in one of the four quadrants looking to strike. So if my opponent right now is most likely looking to strike from their upper right against my upper left. So as I shoot this point forward, I turn slightly this way. Now we're pretty close just because of camera angles, but as you can see, if they don't want to be hit, they now have to push this blade aside. That opens up the opening that they just came from. So as I shoot out, I can now strike to the opening. This works for any other opening. If my opponent was, say, in a lower left quadrant, I would shoot out with my point turned to the lower left. This forces them to drive the point up, allowing me to then move to that quadrant. So once again, it's not a constrainment. It's a shoot your point straight and force them to go, uh, knock that point line, out of line and come around. Now, if you hit them, Great, but it's, that's probably not going to happen unless they're sleeping or something. The idea is it provokes the sudden reaction and opens them up. So let's talk about artifacts. Now, will this work in like a modern HEMA context with gear? I would argue maybe. Depends on how much the person respects this as a sword. If you're dealing with your classic idiot HEMA guy, and I'm here like this, if I shoot out with this, all he's going to do is just hit me in the head for a double. Why? Because he really doesn't fear the sword. It's a, t it's a sport tool for him, not so much as a, a martial art or a weapons-based martial art for him. So that's one artifact where you'll see in our modern training that could fail. If you're fighting someone who's good, this will almost assuredly work because, uh, yeah, yeah, because when he shoots for my chest, I do not want to get hit with the point of the sword. And I don't see a double as a tie. Double is both people lose. So in that aspect, this is what we talk about artifacts. In historical period, it probably worked quite well. Because if he, if he just went, bringing yourself to high guard, if he went from that high guard position and I started my key position, even if he didn't do very much, I jammed him in the chest with a point, he'll come off balance, which will give me the secondary cut for the head, although thrusting back in the fistula was seriously frowned upon. Who's to say how much of it happened? And it is described in the manuscript. Most likely, though, this is used as a feint, as a provocation. Absolutely. And it does really matter, even if it's a provocation, if that point is just shooting straight for your face, you'll still react most likely if you have any sort of concern for your safety, and especially if you're not wearing a mask. Especially if you don't want to lose an eye. <laughs> uh, other modern artifacts is, I would say this is probably the most difficult guard to do in modern protective gear. Um, you know, the gear, it's, it really bunches up around here. This is not a very comfortable and relaxed position. Typically, a um, manuscript shows it holding the pommel here variations of how you're going to hold the sword doesn't make or break the position but the idea being you're not going to be in a very relaxed position with your gear on you're going to feel like that so that also inhibits the modern usage of this guard that's a very good point so we hope this answers your question in full so about 
more non-lethal techniques. Um, yeah, there are a lot of them. Um, it just depends where you're looking. For instance, armored combat, I mean, capturing someone, being able to ransom them is huge. Um, exactly. So while well, there's lots of armored combatives, you know, break their arm right away, there's also a lot where it just says lock them up. I mean, there's even one from Fiore. When you execute the lock, you come in, boom, it says you bring them down. It even says that you can pen a letter on their back. I wonder how much that autograph's worth. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so definitely lots of unarmed holding techniques, and Lakushner is even one where it describes if you just want to have some fun with your friends, you can do this, put them in the lock, and then have someone bring a big burlap sack, and you can throw them in the burlap sack. There's also um. a play showing <laughs> someone getting backgammon played on them. However, no one in Blood and Iron can play backgammon, so, you know, that's not going to happen. Interpretation's today. still pending. Julian sucks at backgammon, don't listen to him. Um, yeah, so definitely lots of uh, unarmored capture lock type stuff, but there's uh, even other applications of non-lethal techniques. So now we'll work on, we'll talk about Meyer, right? <clears throat> Meyer uses a lot of flats. There's tons of flats in Meyer. So for example, I could throw a cut, he intercepts, and I can come up and smack him in the side of the ear with the flat of my blade. Now, is that a great solution if you're going to kill someone? No, like, it'll really hurt. You might even knock a, a dude out if he was particularly not very strong. How much force could I get into it? Enough that it will hurt. Like this is still a three pound iron, like steel bar, right? So side of the, side of the head with the flat of the sword, not, not really pleasant. The other thing too you want to consider is German self-defense laws at the time. There are lots of things talking about when the, in the time of the mess where people strike people with the flat, it may only have been legal to strike someone with the flat at that time. We don't really know the complexities of German law, but there are tidbits mentioned in different historical sources. Exactly. And I mean, it changes through time and location, but, you know, we do know for sure there was a differentiation where there were scenarios where it was okay to hit someone with your flat, but not okay to just cut them down. So it's, um, you know, a very viable self-defense tactic. Although I just prefer to cut them down. <laughs> but, yeah. you know... I also don't prefer to go to jail and lose all my money. Most people don't. Um, so even, you know, you look at other weapons and even some earlier period sources, if you look at uh, Lakushner's Messer. So first of all, there are tons of techniques that he describes, oh, this would be, you know, you can, this can be great in a school setting, or, you know, if you don't want to hurt them, just, you know, smash them with your in the flat, in the belly or something. Um, there's even lots of instances where it talks about using the point to push someone away. Now, with a sharp sword, you cannot push someone away. Um, with the blunt, you can. So in a scenario where someone has cut past you, um, they're coming around for another attack, if I can just push this point here, I can push him backwards, all right? And so that's, that. it doesn't say run them through, it says push them backwards at the point. Now, that's a warding action. Whether that was threaten them with a sharp sword or teaching you how to use a non-sharp implement to fight with, you know, you can, uh, you, that can be up to interpretation. So once again, it's a, an attack, a technique where it doesn't just say stab them, run them through. The, the sequence described is a non-lethal sequence. So. Trying, yeah, you're basically trying to resolve a situation without killing the person and having a costly legal battle. But even then, even if you did have a blunt sword working as tournament, if I did drive him back, like even that little bit does not feel very pleasant straight underneath the sternum, right? Or if you hit someone in the liver, there's lots of boxing matches where people have been knocked out by a liver hit. It could happen with a blunt sword too. Yeah, so non-lethal tactics do appear. Um, Say number of places, dagger as well. Ooh, yeah, Dutch dagger. <laughs> a particularly fun one. Uh, <laughs> the text of the play actually says, once you've made the parry, you can then grab the thumb and walk them to jail. Let's walk up to the things so they can actually see what I'm talking about here. Like, you get a good view. In essence here, you basically grab the guy by the thumb, and you take him to the local sheriff, I don't think you'd probably get him all the way to jail with the technique because he'd probably be trying to fight you. Um, but you get the concept behind it. I have walked out a person with a thumb lock before. There's 
thumblocks in different martial art, in different unarmed martial arts that show up. And a thumb lock is pretty painful. It really isn't pleasant. You can break someone's thumb quite easily. And with a nice heavy, like this is wood, but a heavy steel dagger driving into your thumb would be less pleasant. Also back then, if you'd like say cut the thumb off or damaged it so much it couldn't be used, that might be your livelihood. That would be a really expensive error. And then you'd be stuck begging on the street from someone from a craftsman to now a beggar. So people don't really realize that they take for grant the, granted the modern medicine we have now. They're like, oh, it's just a broken thumb. Well, it had a little bit of different context back then. Once again, thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. Yeah, thank you very much. If you uh, want a question answered, definitely head on over to our Patreon page. Um, every month we're answering very detailed answers for all of our uh, mailbag Patreon supporters. Um, or if you have a smaller question, ask down in the comments, just like always, and you know we'll see if we can uh, address it in a smaller format. Yeah, we're happy to help.